Welcome, everybody. I'm Abby Glassenberg, and I'm the co-founder and president of Craft Industry Alliance. And today's event is being co-presented with Spoonflower and Craft Industry Alliance. So Spoonflower is a print-on-demand platform and manufacturer of wallpaper, fabric, and home decor. Their online global marketplace connects makers and consumers with independent artists all over the world who earn royalties every time their designs are purchased. Any artist can set up shop at spoonflower.com right now to start growing their surface design business. And this Surface Design Symposium is also being presented by Craft Industry Alliance. And Craft Industry Alliance is a community for creative professionals. So get expert trainings like those that you are experiencing today, every single month, plus become part of a vibrant creative community for advice and support. We have a special coupon code to share with you today. So for participants in today's session, you can use the code Surface Design 2023. That's Surface Design 2023 to save 20% on your membership through October 13th. And that's at craftindustryalliance.org. So, a couple quick housekeeping notes before we get started. Um, we do have some questions prepared for our panelists today. We also really want to hear from you and make sure that we get to some of your questions as well. So we're gonna use the Q&A function here on Zoom to ask questions during this session. The chat can go by pretty fast. So if you put your question in the Q&A, we'll be sure to save it and be able to see it um, when Q&A begins. And I'd also like to note that all of the information shared during the Surface Design Symposium is for educational purposes only and is not legal advice. So we're going to go ahead and get ready to dive in now with our panel discussion. And to begin, let's learn a little bit more about each of our panelists with some introductions. So Jamie, would you go first and tell us a little bit about yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Jamie Derringer's AI avatar. Just kidding. Um, I <laughs> live in San Diego, California, and I, uh, I, started a website called Design Milk. I did that for 16 years. It was a, um, it still is actually still still going, but without me, um, it is a platform for art, architecture, interior design and technology. Um, and after that, I uh, left and I'm doing some consulting in the Web3 space as well as AI and metaverse, bringing um, technology to art and design and seeing where all of that collides. And it's it's really exciting. So I'm really looking forward to this panel. It's going to be great. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Jamie. Um, Stephen, can you go next? Introduce sure. yourself and tell us about yourself. Yeah, so I uh, have led marketing at Joanne Fabric and Crafts. Uh, I've worked at Walmart, Goodyear, and several other large companies. Currently, I own a company called I Try AI, where we educate people on how to use various AI tools, and then we go into uh, medium to large businesses and help them redesign workflows, incorporating uh, AI with existing processes. So uh, really excited to talk to you guys today. Wonderful. Thank you so much for being here, Stephen. And Tammy, you get to go next. So tell us a little bit about yourself as well. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good morning, wherever you would be. Um, I'm uh, Tammy Browning Smith. I am currently hailing from Battle Creek, Michigan. And uh, I have been working in the intellectual property space now for about 20 years. Um, the past year, and of course I'm gonna cough, <coughs> excuse me. Um, I currently serve as a general counsel for uh, Magnolia Pearl, a uh, fashion house located in Texas. And my one of my focuses that I love to practice with is, is, is ar with artificial intelligence, how this is the ethical use of artificial intelligence. Uh, to that, I have, um, I currently serve on the uh, ABA Presidential Commission for Artificial Intelligence and Artificial Intelligence Policy, um, along with the Presidential Commission for Disability Rights. And so, the whole interwining of uh, AI and the ethical uses 
the not so ethical uses um, is something that uh, I look forward to exploring today with everyone. Wonderful. So we've got, as you can see, different perspectives and areas of expertise to bring to the table, which I think is really important for such a big topic and such an important and relevant topic right now. So I think the best way to begin um, is a little bit around defining our terms. So when we're talking about AI, like what are we talking about? And I think it would be helpful if you could name some of the tools people might be familiar with, what they're used for, like, what is this? How do we use this? How do, if we wanted to use AI right now, where would we go to do that? What are they called and how, you know, how do they sort of essentially work? Um, so I think that would be a helpful place to start. And Stephen, if it's okay, we'll begin with you there. Sure. Yeah, I mean, there are thousands and thousands of tools and then tools that are built on top of large language models. Uh, but when we're talking about AI in the creative space, uh, there are some very large and very uh, reputable companies that are doing it. So Canva just launched AI and, and a feature called Magic within their platform. Um, Adobe has generative fill and a lot of other features in their creative suite. So Photoshop and a couple of other products. And then uh, a product that isn't maybe as well known, uh, but is really robust and really powerful is called Midjourney. Uh, and Midjourney is uh, a, a platform that allows you to create images uh, you know, with natural language processing. So you just simply put in a prompt and you can create really high quality images from photography to, you know, vector art and various other forms. So for me, when I'm talking to creatives, uh, those are a lot of the the tools that we, we end up starting with and then deep diving in. That's great. Um, Jamie, do you have any other tools to add to Stephen's list? Uh, yeah. And you know what's really funny? I completely forgot in my intro to tell everybody that I'm an artist because I'm usually not on panels for my art. <laughs> I'm just like, historically, I've always talked about design milk, but I, I've i um, been an artist my entire life. I'm, I'm a creative. And so I draw, I paint, I actually do fiber art. So um, when you go to my Instagram, you'll probably just see a lot of that. <laughs> so I don't want to confuse anybody. Um, but there's also uh, OpenAI is the one that's clearly like in everybody's orbit right now in terms of the media and everything that's going on with with that it's it's also a language learning model um that also has an imagery component called dolly um uh, i think you mentioned mid-journey already and 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 like you said Stephen, there's so many out there right now some of them are built on their own training models and some of them are built um products that are built on top of ai um or sorry open ai's platform Okay, great. So hopefully, you know, and with OpenAI, that's ChatGPT, which is kind of the, the text-based version. But as you said, these are being incorporated into Shopify, into so many, into Canva, and there's so many of the tools that a lot of us have already been using. So we can find them all over the place now. So I hope that helps to kind of ground the conversation that that's what we're going to be talking about today. Um, and um, I guess in general, I was wondering how you all think that artists should view AI today. So like in general, from a, a bird's eye view, from, you know, looking at it as a whole, how should artists think about AI um, right now? And, um, and maybe Jamie, we'll start with you since you're an artist. Sure. Um, I think there's a lot of fear around AI right now, especially from creatives and, um, I guess for me, I'm an incredibly curious person. So immediately when I thought about AI and art, I thought like, oh my gosh, I can't wait to get my hands on this tool. But then when I started talking to other artists, they were like, oh my gosh, it's going to replace me completely. And I'm not going to be able to have a job. And uh, everybody was kind of freaking out. And so I took a step back and thought about it from their perspective and realized that, yes, it's very scary. It, it I mean, we don't really know where it's going. So the unknown is, of course, very, very scary. Um, however, as we're starting, as these tools are starting to be created and as we're seeing them be adopted by, you know, uh, brands like Adobe, um, it, it looks as though they'll be used as tools for artists and I'm using them as a tool for my art. So feeding imagery into them and getting all kinds of things spit back out at me to use as inspiration is really what I find personally for my own art to be 
the best use of it. However, there are so many other use cases that we could continue to talk about here. Um, marketing copy, just, you know, social and site copy, and just to kind of help artists um, be more creative with their art and less focused on the other stuff. As you know, being an artist who also runs a business can be really difficult because the running of the business can take up a lot of time, especially when you're alone. So um, there's a lot of ways that these tools can actually help you have more creative time in, in your practice and, and spend more time in the studio or with your computer instead of writing copy or dealing with accounting or invoicing and all of those other things. So I think it's more like if you can um, put the fear aside for a moment and think about being curious and exploratory with it um, and, and excited about what it could do for you, uh, it can really help expand your business. And I think we can keep talking about that in this session. And Tammy, how do you think artists should view AI right now from that bird's eye perspective? Um, it's interesting. We forget AI has technically been around 40 to 50 years, depends on who you talk to. So it's been around in some form or another. I think the, the important thing is to know what is AI exactly when you're thinking about use. In uh my world, we consider AI anything that where the computer program replaces a human to make a decision or an output. Um, and so when artists are taking a look at, or I should say creatives in general, are, are taking a look at what they're using for tools, you treat it just like any other tool that you've researched. It's no different than any other program. Um, it's knowing what you plan on using, talking to your colleagues, using the experts. Right now, everybody is talking about AI, utilize it. But I agree. I think it was Stephen that said it can be so overwhelming. And I know I mean, there are thousands of programs there. If you know, there are just so many tools, each one has its own direct concern of, you know, in its own specialty. So it depends. What do you want to do with it? Are you using it for inspiration? Are you using it to, to sell? Um, and also what your ultimate consumer will accept and take. Those are the, so when you're looking at AI, um, you know, not all AI is bad. Not all AI is good. It's just like any other tool. And it rec but this, in this case, it's evolving every day. And so it just requires, if this is a tool that you want to use, it just requires the ability to, to uh, not only research, but to network. Stephen, do you have anything to add there around sort of that big, big picture viewpoint sure. on AI right now? Yeah. I mean, I would say to this group, you know, you're in a really, really advantageous position because you're learning about it. Um, and then the, the other thing I would say is if you're an artist and you know your craft, you're actually at a, a better advantage to get good um, products out of AI. And so, you know, if you're a photographer, you know all of the nuances of depth of field, of f-stop, of focus, of all these different things that a lay person would not know because they haven't really learned or educating them, themselves on photography. And so that that ends up becoming a benefit to you because you can talk to AI in a way that's a lot more um it's a lot more intelligent and the AI will actually work better for you than it will just an average person. And so I would say in the very early stages, artists have a much better advantage over any, you know, general person to produce really high quality outputs. Um, now, you know, we've kind of touched this on the surface of, you know, ownership and IP and a lot of different things that come with that. But uh, if you do lean into your curiosity, like uh, Jamie was saying, you actually are going to be able to produce things that other, you know, people that have access to the same exact tools will not be able to. Just like today, if you're an expert at Photoshop or you're an expert at Illustrator, you can produce way better things than people that are working in, you know, Microsoft Paint or things like that. So, again, I think it's a tool and um, artists can really benefit from that tool and, and make it their own in many ways. And we're going to get to the intellectual property 
issues. Don't worry. We are going to get there. Um, but I would love to also begin with, you know, some good news, some some aspects of this that are exciting to you. What do you see as some of the opportunities? And if there's projects that come to mind for you that have employed AI that either you've worked on or that you've noticed out there that you feel are like especially exciting and interesting, I'd love to to hear about those too. So Jamie, do you want to start with that one? Uh, yes. Um, and so there are, ton I mean, I, I don't, I could rattle off a list of like tons of, of tools that you can use. Um, we already talked about the main tools and I'm um, Abby, I'm not sure if this is the question you're asking, like more specific tools for artists and also to use, tools, but also projects that you've seen or interesting, yeah. you know, things that you've noticed that people are doing and using this tool for to create something that you're like, wow, that is really innovative and different and worthwhile. Yeah, I have a friend who um, is is looking at creating a, a line of characters and and toys, and so she's been prompting uh, Dolly uh, with just text prompts, you know, and coming out with these really cool characters, and then she can then feed those images back into AI and ask it to create three D renderings, um, and so it's really powerful in terms of ideating and and proof of concept. Um, uh, and it's faster, right? So uh, I want to kind of, I'm going off on a tangent. Sorry, Abby. No uh, <laughs> I just want to talk a little bit about the, uh, the ideation um, of AI and how powerful it is. Because if you think about like in the design world, uh, 3D printing was a huge thing for a moment and everybody freaked out because they thought 3D printing was going to replace and everyone was going to have a 3D printer at home. We were going to print our own chairs. Why do we need furniture manufacturers? Why do we need designers if someone can just figure it out on their own? That never happened. But what did happen was designers and architects were able to have a 3D printer in their office and they were able to very, very quickly prototype their ideas instead of having to do clay models or paper models and, and things like that. So this is a tool that can help you become way faster at your concepting and your ideas. Um, and it gives you that visual that you, it might take you, you know, days to sketch it out or, or put it into Illustrator. Um, or even Procreate or some tool like that. Um, and, and I think too, we'll, we'll see the AI coming into all those, just like we're seeing it come into the Adobe suite um, to really get, just get you to your ideas faster. And I think that that's super duper exciting. Sorry to go off on a tangent. No, that's totally relevant. <laughs> but I, I, yeah. I really think that these, um, you know, I, I've seen so many people come up with all kinds of concepts. I have a friend, Nicholas Baker, who's a, a furniture designer, and he, um, you know, he uses VR actually to sketch out his ideas. And sometimes he'll feed them into AI and see what comes out of it. And, and then he'll make physical pieces based on the designs that he's putting in. So I, I think it's, you know, if we think about it, like um, any other tool we have in our, you know, arsenal, quiver, whatever you want to say. Um, you know, we have Photoshop already. We have Illustrator. We have all these programs. This is just another plugin or add on top of that. Um, and it just can make us so much more creative and so much more powerful and therefore, I think, more valuable. Stephen, do you have particular projects that you've seen that excite you, that you've noticed out there that seem really worth you know, looking at and, and exploring further? Yeah, I mean, I think um, kind of to echo Jamie a little bit on the enthusiasm and the excitement of prototyping and getting an idea to execution or at least to a, an MVP, a, a minimum viable product is, is something that I'm extremely excited about. I built a children's book or children's story generator AISlumber.com. You just fill in a few fields and it generates a, you know, five to 10 minute story for bedtime. I've got four kids, so it helps me every night. Um, I think the other thing is becoming a more holistic artist. So if you're a really good photographer, but you were never really good at um, illustration, or you were never really good at some of these other forms of art that you really like, uh, and you're inspired by, but you can't actually produce that work, you now have the means and the ability 
to take an idea and actually execute it to a much higher fidelity level uh, than you ever have uh, before. So you can become a broader artist and you can explore a lot of mediums that you maybe didn't have the capability to before. Um, Eleven Labs is a website that I'm extremely interested in. It's uh, taking text to voice so you can create a vocal avatar so if you are a book writer, you can basically narrate with AI. You can create different forms of maybe your artwork where you actually have a vocal component or you've got other artistic expressions associated with something that you you, you do in the physical world, perhaps. Uh, so scan a QR code and you can tell somebody about your artwork uh, via AI or something like that. So uh, another tool that I use a lot is there's an AI for that.com. Uh, which has almost 10,000 AI tools on it. It's it's basically just a big directory of AI tools. And so if you're interested in exploring, obviously Google, you can even talk to ChatGPT. But uh, if you go on there, there's just tons and tons and tons of tools that are all across the spectrum. So it might not necessarily be art, but it might be business or it might be, I know Jamie said, you know, accounting, copy, you know, you can offload some of that busy work to AI now uh, and focus more on your creative ventures, which I think is, is a huge benefit of AI. And Tammy, I know you had something to add, I think as well. And I was wondering, especially since you work kind of on the disability perspective with this, um, if there's things that you've seen in that world that have been beneficial. Absolutely. And sorry, I'd accidentally clicked the raise hand, even though I, oh, okay. <laughs> I didn't mean, I do have something I do. <laughs> something in, in this is a, we as, as creatives, as the, especially the people doing surface design have a tremendous resource for AI that we just don't realize. And we're seeing it in the AI community as far, excuse me, the disability community. Um, the photographers are starting to see that, have, have really embraced this. And that is most, I bet you most people sitting on this, uh, on this webinar have a vast digital library. That vast digital library is great to train. You own it, you know it, and it's just sitting there. And there are people looking for it because they want secure, trainable um, databases. So um, um, one, and I I think, well, Jesse will put up the thing. A great example is something called, v I always call, I always print it, so it's visual or visual, V-A-I-S-U-A-L. It's a group of photographers that got together. And when you're talking about in the disability community and you're talking about in several different communities, they created data sets, clean data sets from their work that now train others. So you now have the ability if we're, you know, there's so many concerns about AI and what's being trained in facial recognition and some of these types of things. Um, they, there are communities of creatives who are saying, not only are we worried about what you're going to use to train, why don't you use one of ours and you know that it's it's good work. So that's what I hope people will understand. I think it was Stephen that said, as as the people on this call have a great under more, you know, we're ahead of the game. And that's what made me, reminded me of this because you were ahead of this game and you, you have this library, you have the digital knowledge, why not be part of the solution? And that's starting I'm people. Not sure I understand. Oh, sorry. All of a sudden <laughs> my, my watch decided to say, I don't understand. Um, but part of the solution, we have that ability. And um, so that's where some of these communities and in, in some of these creatives are really starting to not only bring assets back and, and create revenue, but also um, shape policy and projects. And, you know, I, I've seen in the chat that, you know, and, and we all know that we're grappling with some of the challenges that AI presents as artists when you're thinking about data sets and how these, you know, AI 
large language models and things are trained where, you know, they're scouring the internet, looking at every image, including images we might have created in the past without giving our consent for them to, to scour, um, and then um, using those to create, you know, to, to, to create new, new imagery. And, and there's a lot of intellectual problems. Pro uh, property concerns there. So I would love to delve into that now. Um, that's, a, you know, a huge area of, of worry for artists. Um, and so maybe we'll start with you, Tammy, since that is um, your area of expertise. How do you um, advise artists or how do you think, you know, help artists to think about the copyright concerns here, the intellectual property theft concerns here? <laughs> Everybody grab it, grab, grab a drink and Pick up your feet for a while. No, um, seriously, this is, it's, it's, there isn't one solution. The EU has a different solution from the United States. I um, have, there will be in the chat, and I think after in the recording, there will be a whole litany of, um, of resources that I've been able to give you so you can follow up. These are the ones that I, I check in on, on a pretty reasonable basis. Um, the best thing that you can do with your IP is honestly watch. Look, if, if let's get real, the millions and millions of of data, you know, of images that have been used for data sets, unless something comes out, you're not going to ever see it. You're going to know that it's going to be trained. So at the end of the day, it's being diligent about what you're doing now, knowing what programs you have you're doing now. One of the things that a lot of people don't grasp sometimes when they're using these AI programs is what do they do with the information? What so say you say you've been great. You've kept your stuff out of every data set. You kept yourself out and you are right there ready, you know, but you're using these programs. What happens with what you create? A lot of times that goes back into training the AI model. So then now if you've kept all your stuff out up until this point, well, now you've just introduced it. So knowing your tools allows you to know what's you know as far as protecting your protecting your art the other thing that's very important is knowing your audience um you know if you are creating ai or if you're creating ai generated works and you want to be able to license it or protect it in some way your best friend better be the u.s copyright office if you are in the u.s because you're in because that's changing all the time we have some more uh, you know, notice of inquiry and requests for information coming out um, October 30th, the Copyright Office wants to hear. I mean, it's an ever evolving situation. So if you want to protect it, you better know what you're creating in the first place um, and whether it can be protected. So when it comes to intellectual property, it, it's, it's anyone's game on this. I, I will tell you, um, for example, um, something very interesting, just to give you an idea, um, the, if you're not following the Authors Guild um, lawsuit right now, uh, I, there's a link for that. I, I gave up a link for the Authors Guild and uh, 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 Mary Raffisberger, who's a, a wonderful, uh, she leads the Authors Guild. Her and her team have really kept up that website, but it brings the situation that at the end of the day, one of the solutions is they have to start from scratch. So the technology is fine, but what trained it isn't. So therefore all the scraping. So basically they have to start from zero. That's one of the solutions. That's pretty harsh, but that's one of the reviews. That's one of the views on intellectual property right now is it's fruit of the poisonous tree to use a criminal legal term or, you know, something like that. And so it really, the best thing that you can do is know your tool that you're using, know what tools you're using, knowing what they're doing with it. And then also knowing when I should say, pardon me, when I say knowing what they're doing with it, when I'm saying knowing what they're doing with your output, your generative work, but then also what your audience is. 
um, and, and what you want to do with that art. And even now, even where, if it's EU, if it's UK, um, no matter where that is. Oh, and now all of a sudden, I, I, I can Amy, do you have thoughts about intellectual property as well um, when it comes to um, art and AI since, you know, you are creating art that is, with AI and, and probably is being used to train AI on both sides? Yeah, and I'm guilty of feeding all my stuff into AI. So <laughs> it's just got all of my all of my stuff now. Um, but I what I think is um, you know, I, I don't know how much you're gonna be able to avoid it because if you have patterns or products or a, a public social media platform where you're sharing your images, you know, it's gonna be scraped at some point. Um I have been a member of uh, Be Original Americas, which is a, a brand, uh, an, an alliance that really helps um, fight uh, inauthentic design in, um, in, in product design. So very focused on original design and promoting that and talking about the harm of knockoffs, et cetera. Um, and so I've talked to so many designers and so many manufacturers about intellectual property and design. I think it's probably a little different than this, but these issues are going to come up there as well. Um, if you're feeding your, your information into AI, yes, it's possible someone will, will knock it off. But if you put your image on the internet, that's also a possibility that someone's going to take it, steal it, put it up and resell it. A lot of people have had this issue before. Um, and so it's not new. There's always going to be bad actors. But what I've always told people who um, are designers, especially who have had these issues, um, is that your brain is incredibly powerful and creative and you can continue to create and innovate and make new things. Um, if someone takes your design and tries to knock it off, you are in a good position to move forward and innovate, right? So I feel like um, I'm trying to say this in a way that my brain, sorry, it's really early here, specific time. Um, um, but what I'm trying to say is you can continue to make new creative things um, and someone else is profiting off of your old design, but you're still working. You're still pushing forward. You're still innovating. And that's where you have a leg up on someone who's stealing your design, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> What about you, Stephen? Do you have thoughts about this copyright question and intellectual property question, um, which, you know, is really at the center, I think, for so many people? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's a very complex um, and challenging problem to solve. There are, you know, there are some stances where you can prompt uh, mid journey or Dolly or some of these uh, programs, and you can actually use an artist's name. So you can say in the style of, and to me, I mean, I think that's, uh, that's really challenging because you're essentially saying, I, I want to basically replicate that artist's style and I want to just infuse my own ideas, but I don't have the skill set to be able to actually execute that work. And so to me, that's challenging. I think we need to figure out a solution for that. Um, I do think that you can replicate an artist's style with language. And so if it's Jackson Pollock or if it's, you know, um, Norman Rockwell or if it's something like that, you can describe and you can you can get to a style that's very similar without actually using that artist's name. And I think that um, I'm much more pro that, you know, if you want to try and create a, a Norman Rockwell type piece, you have to use the language that gets you there versus just saying in the style of Norman Rockwell. So I think that's where I kind of draw the line personally. That's where I really try and um, share that message is I, I think that's kind of a cheap cop out. But at the same time, there's a lot of people that say everything in in the world is derivative and, you know, nobody's creating anything unique, really. It's all just creative recombination of stuff that came before. And then there's other people that are on the far extreme of like everything that's created by anybody is 100% protectable and shouldn't, you know, shouldn't be used unless 100% consent is given. And it's like, well, if I walk outside of my house and I see, you know, a sculpture, you know, you can't 
stop me from seeing it and having some inspiration from that. So it's very complex is, is maybe my long winding <laughs> answer. Mm-hmm. And Jamie, I see your hand up as well. Did you have something to add there? Yeah, I do. You made me remember kind of what I was trying to say before, which is like, if you type something in like um, a photo of the Star Wars cast as, you know, in the style of Wes Anderson, and you get like everybody looking, you know, with those pastel colors and all that filter. Um, Wes Anderson has a very specific style that you can replicate. Not everybody has a style. So um, I would say like, it's not always going to be easy to replicate your particular style because maybe you don't always make the same thing that always looks the same. Um, But what I was trying to say before is that uh, if you're just making something that's so easily recognizable, like in my opinion, and this is might be controversial, but as an artist, if you're not continually evolving and pushing forward and changing, then like that's challenging. I I think it could be problematic. And so I think that, you know, maybe you have a style that works for you, but maybe you need to push into a new territory that's like innovative. And I think AI can actually help you do that. Um, I also think that if someone were to type in, oh, I'm going to make a movie in the style of Wes Anderson, nobody's going to take that seriously and put it on the big screen because you really want Wes Anderson. You don't want some dude that's pretending to be Wes Anderson, right? So I think it will value the original creator even more in some ways. Um, I'm contradicting myself here and I understand that, but (laughs) I think that's human nature. Um, So I I really think that you might become more valuable as a human creator versus someone who can just type something into a computer and spit out something that looks like something you're doing authentically. Tammy, do you have something to add there? Oh, yeah. (laughs) I just have to be clear on all of this. Whether you say in the style of or you do it by prompt, no matter how you do it, if it looks like it, talks like it, and acts like it, it is. Meaning if it looks like a duck and you create a duck and it wasn't your duck, it is copyright infringement. And this is where they're running into a situation right now. This is where we're starting to see a lot of litigation, even whether it's created with AI or if it's created by hand. Just to be clear, controversial or not, I agree, and we can all sit here, but one thing is if the output looks like something that's already there, now, yes, and then it goes, it, we then, blah, excuse me, get me all excited here. We then get into the copyright infringement analysis. So please be careful when you're creating all this AI, however you do it, or let's, you know, whatever's trained, but at the end of the day, the generative output still is subject to the copyright infringement analysis, the patent infringement analysis, the trademark infringement analysis, no matter how you get to it. So in other words, the the laws still apply just because we have a new set of tools doesn't mean that our legal system has somehow fallen away. It is still there and still applicable. And we had a couple of comments along those lines in the chat. Um, Kathy says, what about the subject of abusive inspiration? For example, you can get banned from getting images if you do an original illustration in the style of a famous artist, even if it's your own character. So um, that was one comment that sort of aligned there. And then um, and then Jessica had a kind of an interesting question that went with that is, do you believe that the prop- proper resources exist to protect artists and creatives with copyrighted materials? Or are there already like too many loopholes to control this? Are we already out of control? Which I thought was a really interesting question. Like, are we already past? Um, But what you're saying, Tammy, is no, like we're not already out of control, that the the same laws that govern intellectual property are still governing intellectual property. They are. And that's the, that's the thing. At the end of the day, all of this we're talking about until some, I don't think the genie's out of the box. We're getting close in some of these areas, but at the end of the day, no matter what all we talk about, you know, we then look 
at the use at copyright infringement, like I said, patent infringement and the fair use articles. Now there are fair use articles. There are fair use exceptions to all of that stuff. So I'm not saying that that doesn't go out the window. I'm just simply saying no matter what, whether some people say they're adequate, inadequate or whatever, we still have a body of law that governs the output. Right. I think that's really important to keep in mind. And I would love to talk a little bit about how, and we can always return to that um, uh, intellectual property question, but um, but I'd love to talk a little bit about how artists can use the AI tools that are out there, and we've listed so many of them already, um, to generate more income. In other words, to build your business, to be more productive, whether that's like generating more ideas, expanding whatever it is you're offering now into offering more, um, tackling business related tasks, basically using this to your benefit. So Stephen, will you start off start us off with that one? Sure. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, getting into the tools uh, and you know designing workflows, I think is really helpful with AI. And so if you're doing, um, layer creation in Photoshop, and then you're, you know, exporting it to Illustrator, and then you're exporting it and you're uploading it to Shopify or whatever it might be. I think just evaluating some of the processes, and this isn't even AI related, but exploring tools like Zapier or Make um, that help automate a lot of things. Because I think when I when I talk to a lot of businesses and and certainly entrepreneurs and small businesses, there's a lot of like manual effort that's going on. And it's kind of like this mentality of just, you know, work harder and that's how you get more output. When, if you step back and do a 10,000 foot view of what you're doing and the processes that you're doing, you can actually automate and really help yourself out. And so an example might be you create stickers that are, you know, die cut stickers you do the creation in a, a platform that you're used to, or you use a new one like mid journey or some other AI. And then you uh, work through the workflow to automatically create all of the tagging with AI. You create all of the content. That's the description content. You create all of the alt text uh, for the website. You create like all of that thing. All of those things can be AI generated. Uh, and they can also be automated. And so when you're doing the creative process and then you feel good about whatever the output is, you can then just hit a button and kickstart all of that drudgery, if you will. Uh, and then it just kind of pops onto your Shopify website or whatever platform that you're using. And so that's what I would say is really evaluate the process to going from creative to actually selling your work in whatever capacity it is. Uh, and it can be physical work too. Like you can do automatic prospecting. You can do all kinds of different things uh, related to, um, uh, you know, managing that process as well. So uh, that's one thing that I would say. Jamie, what about you? Um, as far as like expanding your offerings, creating more income, more opportunities, streamlining, what have you seen there? Yeah, I mean, I, I touched a little bit on this previously about how it can really help you with like web copy or captions or recommend hashtags or just anything, accounting, invoicing. I'm, I'm sure that like uh, there's HoneyBook AI now. Um, I'm sure QuickBooks is, is working on one if they don't have one already to just help you generate those things more quickly so that you can push the business, the administrat and administrative tasks aside and focus on creating, which is really your passion, right? Um, so there are tons of that. Zapier is really awesome. Um, Shopify is getting supercharged. I'm sure there's more plugins that are going to be developed for Shopify that are AI. So anything that can help automate things is like, you know, for me is thumbs up because then I can just draw or paint or take a walk or whatever, you know? Um, and one thing I think that's really interesting too is, is I've, I've seen um, with AI since it started becoming popular in the news, it really started with the images and um, everybody got really pumped and excited and now it's kind of easy to recognize the AI images online and we know what they look like and we're kind of almost bored of that now. And the money is going into tools for business. And we're seeing um, 
Uh, I think, Tammy, like you said, people uh, creating software so that you can train your own AI on your own products. Companies are, are going to want that, too, for their own proprietary information, et cetera, um, and their product lines and inventory. All of the money that is being raised right now is going into much more business, um, you know, government, science, medicine. I mean, gosh, AI for medicine is going to be game changing, I think. Um, so I don't really see the creative parts of this becoming as problematic as maybe other AI issues. <laughs> um, I don't know, Tammy, maybe I'm, I'm wrong, but it definitely feels like we've kind of peaked in terms of like how many times we can see the same types of mid journey images on the internet. And then everybody's kind of like, okay, what's next? Right. And I feel like they were so cool, right? When we first started seeing them. Um, now they're so easy to recognize. Yeah. And it was like, maybe like uh, less than six months between then and now where you're like, okay, that's AI generated. And I've seen like yarn companies, for example, they'll put in a prompt, get this image of somebody wearing this like fantastical, you know, looks like it's knitted costume or whatever. And everybody in the comments is like, why are you posting this AI generated art? feature real artists, you know? And so I feel like we've turned there. We all see it. We all know what it is and recognize it. And it was a really quick moment between then and now, which is, I think, an interesting thing um, to think about. And Jessica had a really good question, um, Tammy, I thought maybe you might be able to answer. So she said in the Q&A, so many companies like Spoonflower do not accept AI generated artwork. And like, this is for the Spoonflower con design contests and things like that. You can't um, you can't upload AI generated artwork, but she asks, how will artists be able to provide evidence of originality? So what, like, would you advise an artist, you know, if somebody, cause I, I have seen artists be accused in, in those kinds of design contests. Oh, that must be AI generated. And it wasn't. And so what should they do, you know, um, to be able to prove that, I guess. Talking about an excellent question that segues because as, as, you know, Jamie just said, why, you know, we've, have we seen the peak of the use of AI, you know, AI art, and it is going to other, you know, into other non uh, art spaces. This is what you just brought up is why, in, in, in my opinion, the, the proof landscape, the regulatory landscape, it's, we all love to create art, but at the end of the day, one of the main reasons we create art is to create money, you know, to generate some sort of, and that's, how do you prove? It's, unfortunately, it's the same way you prove whether or not you did something, how many layers you did in, in Adobe. Um, and there is no proof. You're, you can only, one of the, one of the ways in the, in the, non-AI world, you prove that this is your, you know, this is your creative output is based on your body of your previous body of work, your skill, your, your uh, tools that you utilize and that history. Now the same thing is going to go with um, when you do something, if it, whether it is or isn't AI generated. And so that to answer the the real question at hand is how do we how how do we keep you know how do we prove it's AI how do we not once you know, it, it just boils down to how do we prove it if it you know how do how, how do we prove art is ours um, and in a legal perspective like I said it it, it just based on your history and your tools. I hope and that was Stephen. Stephen, do you have something to add there? Yeah, I mean, um, if folks in this discussion don't know a lot about Web three or NFTs or blockchain, I think it's worth spending an hour or two uh, researching. And I do think we're coming to a point in history where it's going to be difficult to prove whether or not you posted on social media, whether that's you in the picture whether the deep fake is real, like there's, there's a much broader problem than just, did you use AI to create that art? It's like, 
what can we trust anymore that's digital on the internet? And um, blockchain, I think, is going to solve that problem. And it's really, it's too complex to really get into a deep discussion here. But the essence of it is there's this public ledger. And let's say you have an ID, the public ledger, which everyone can see, can know that you posted that from your account and nobody else did. So if there's a copy paste situation where somebody's like, I actually created that meme or I created that design or I created this or I said that, you can actually provably and factually know that they didn't do that because of blockchain. And so I think we're going to see social networks that are riding on blockchains. I think we're going to see work in the digital space like pattern making and all these other things that we're talking about today uh, is going to move to the blockchain to where you can prove that you were the one who created that first. Uh, now, whether or not you used an AI tool uh, to to generate it is is a different story, but you were the one who actually generated that digital asset, and nobody else can refute that because it's factually and uh, unchangeably you know marked forever on the blockchain. So, and Jamie, you had something to add there, and I know you've done a lot of NFTs too, which is sort of a separate conversation, but um, but related, as Stephen is mentioning. Yeah, easily talk at least an hour about the blockchain and art, digital art um, and ownership. But I, I was just going to add um, to what Stephen was saying that I, I think in the future we'll see the intersection of these things because the new internet may be powered by the blockchain. So we'll be able to see who creates things and um, human ownership, I think, um, and human presence will be much more valued because um, we'll see a lot more content that's being generated by AI, whether that's articles or images that go with articles that stock art, et cetera. A lot of that's gonna be created um, by prompting or you know, just edited by humans, but not generated by humans. So I, I actually believe in the future that our value will go up as creatives and that's the positive optimistic aspect of this. I'm sure there's an opposing view, <laughs> um, but I'm trying to be optimistic and excited about what's, what's possible in the future. And maybe we'll consider devaluing um, uh, images that are fully generated by AI. I don't know because we're not there yet, but that's my hope is that human creativity will um, be valued. And you can even see pushback on this. If you see accounts that post an AI image that's clearly something from mid-journey, the comments are like, this is AI, this is AI. This is... People don't want to see that. They want to see real pictures that you created. They don't want to see AI. So there'll be a lot of um, pushback from your, you know, all of us as human beings. Yeah, absolutely. And and I heard a, a statement recently that was something to the effect of it's not that AI is going to put you out of business as an artist. It's the artists who know how to use AI that are going to put you out of business. So in other words, you need to become somebody who is familiar with this and understands it, can use it and bring that skill set along with your artistic um, skill set together to the table. And that is really valuable. So to say, well, I'm going, I'm not going to um, learn this at all, which is a choice and and I think is also okay. But um, but the but artists who do decide to to jump in and learn and be part of the conversation and, and develop those skills maybe are the ones who, you know, have a leg up in some way in the future. So I thought that was an interesting thing to think about. I'm not sure if I agree or disagree, but um, but certainly something to, to consider. Um, and then there was a question from Kara in the, the Q&A, Stephen, for you. Um, and she says, do you see an ethical responsibility of designers, entrepreneurs, businesses to ensure that the AI generated web copy, the captions, the alt text, all the things you were mentioning earlier is reviewed and scrutinized. I'm thinking by a human being before being published, thinking about like the biases that may be represented in that copy, you know, that may go unnoticed unless it's being scrutinized. So is there like a, an ethical responsibility there to actually review it and not just like copy paste, you know? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, and I don't, you know, it's, I think it's a loaded question in some sense. I think there's a lot of uh, folks that go to tag generators today and there's, I'm sure some bias in whatever those algorithms are. There is bias in mid journey outputs. That's been kind of widely reported. Um, 
based on gender and race and various other factors. And so I do think there is going to be some kind of governance and or there needs to be a discussion around that um, when it comes to text output and things like that, whether it's alt text or whether it's tags or whether it's descriptions or things like that. I mean, I think it's always wise to review as if you're, you know, from different angles, right? Like how is my core consumer look? Or if you've got psychographics, you know, how would this read to uh, Janine, who's a mother of two who lives in the inner city or whatever it is, right? Like looking at things from multiple angles is always the right decision. Um, but to say like an entrepreneur shouldn't just copy and paste, I, I don't know. I think it, I would absolutely recommend doing it, but is it an ethical problem? I'm not sure. And then Lee in the comments or in the q and I'm sorry, had a, another interesting question. This might be best for you, Tammy. She asks, do I need an AI disclaimer? I'm thinking maybe like on the website or something like that. Is that going to do anything? Is there a reason for that? Disclaimers. They warm an attorney's heart. Um, but first off, whether or not you need an AI disclaimer, I don't know of a law yet that requires it. So let's let's go there. However, it, once again, it's going to depend what you're doing. If it's just if you're just posting the art because it's art, that's one thing. If you're posting the art to sell, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, uh, just because of the controversy surrounding it and the ownership questions. Um, so it depends. Unfortunately, I don't mean to give you the attorney answer of maybe, but as a general rule, educate, anytime you can educate your consumer in an honest and transparent way, you're better. And Jamie, you had your hand up as well. I want to make sure I get to you before we close. Yes. Just to add to what Tammy was saying about that, um, TikTok has, uh, introduced a disclosure that where you have to say that it was generated by AI. So I think we'll see more of that from the social media companies, um, as some sort of disclosure, kind of the same thing you do with sponsored content or an ad. And then separately, a lot of friends that I have who are artists who are using AI in their workflow are disclosing it as a material similar to spray huh. paint or <laughs> fiber or, you know, yarn or whatever it is. Um, you know, it, it was used in the process of their workflow, but it wasn't the only thing in their workflow. So it's just something to think about. Yeah, that's great. Very interesting. Well, this has been incredibly interesting. So much food for thought. I think there's, you know, fewer conclusions and more questions, really. And, and that's where we are, realistically, with this technology right now. And I think that's totally okay and to be expected. Um, my hope is that our eyes are open. We're looking, we're thinking critically, we're experimenting and um, and continuing to ask these questions as we go forward. So Jamie and Stephen and Tammy, I appreciate your willingness to share where we are right now from your perspective, your point of view with all of us. Everyone in the um, chat, as well as in the Q&A, thank you too for um, expressing your thoughts and concerns. It really helps to sort of as a community understand where we are right now and and, I, and where we need to go and what we need to think about. So I appreciate all of you and, um, and thank you. We have one more session in the Surface Design Symposium. So we'll hope to see you at that next one. And for now, thank you everybody for coming today.